I have one hour to talk to you, uh, and I got a, a lot to present, so I don't know how I'm going to do this. Anyway, here's what I have to present to you today. I want to share some uh, information about advanced vestibular diagnostic systems. And I have been involved in um, vestibular um, equipment for diagnostic equipment for vestibular testing since 1974. And I hate to say that to audiences nowadays because I got so many people that go, oh, that's before I was born. Anyway, and naturally things have come a long way. Uh, it, it used to be very common that doctors would complain about an ENG test, that they have patients with, with valid symptoms and they send them for an, uh, what was an ENG test back then, a, a electronystagmography, and it would come back with all normal, no findings. Uh, it's, it's actually a false negative, it's just that the testing wasn't sensitive enough to, to uh, locate any pathologies. So over the years, things have changed drastically and things have become more sensitive. And what we're finding now is that balance centers want to be inclusive and be able to test every component of the vestibular system. And so something like this is a very typical test battery that they would do V-HIT, that's a head impulse test, a C-VAMP and an O-VAMP, that's a vestibular evoked biogenic potential, an ECOG, which we're doing a much better job with today than we've ever done before, um, and I'd also want to talk to you about the last thing on this list, and that's Micromedical's new, uh, new VNG system, video nystagmography. So let's start with the video head impulse test. This is something that has become quite popular in the last few years, and the reason that it has become popular is because it is a way that you can actually individually test all six semicircular canals. Um, and it's something that once you develop the technique, you can do very easily and very quickly. <clears throat> it doesn't, re doesn't require any response from the patient except that he um, sits there and cooperates. It's not an active test for the patient, it's passive, meaning the patient doesn't have to do anything, you do it for them. And these systems are like this. This happens to be an interacoustics IC cam, it's called, uh, a video head impulse test system. And it simply is a set of goggles like this. And the goggles are unique in that they are very, very lightweight, extremely lightweight. And, um, and you have an infrared camera here, a very high high-speed infrared camera, so it's extremely high resolution. Uh, here's the camera at the, at the tip of it, but built into here is a motion sensor as well, so that you can measure head movement versus eye movement. And you're actually using the vestibular ocular reflex to actually get this response. So all of the hardware involved in this is this one simple headset and it just contains a very lightweight, very high resolution infrared camera to record eye movement, uh, as well as a motion sensor to record head movement. And head movement is done by the clinician, not the patient, and it's done in both the uh, horizontal plane and the vertical plane. And this is what re re requires technique. It's extremely technique sensitive and it takes a while, it takes some practice to get good at actually performing the proper impulse, which would be like this. And uh, somebody like uh, Dr. Gans does a great job at teaching people how to, how to do this. Uh, but the equipment actually teaches you how to do it as well. Because for every impulse that you try to make, uh, 
when you do it correctly, you get a nice green check mark like this. In other words, you move the he head fast enough. Uh, and when you don't, you get a red X that tells you, well, we're going to reject that one because you didn't move the head fast enough. So it takes a little bit of practice, but once you've got it down, you can do it on anybody who's cooperating. And uh, you end up with a graph like this that shows you head movement versus eye movement. Uh, this, is, this is, in this case, the head movement here. And you simply are trying to move the head fast enough that it falls within this red area. And when it does, you get this green check mark. And the system records head movement versus eye movement. And you expect the eyes to move in an equal and opposite direction uh, via the vestibular ocular reflex. You expect the eye to move in an equal to, but opposite direction of the head when you do this impulse. And so the way you end up testing all six semicircular canals is um, you do one that's lateral. In other words, this is the lateral canals, and this is on the horizontal plane. That's motions like this. And then you end up just turning the patient's head about 40 degrees uh, to the side, and then you're going to be moving the head in the uh, horizontal direction. And that's called LARP, L-A-R-P. That is in order to test the left anterior and the right posterior semicircular canal. And then when you do it with the head turned in the opposite direction, it's called a LARP. You're testing the right anteri anterior and the left posterior canal. So in all, you've ended up testing all six canals. And uh, again, this takes practice, especially the vertical movements. The horizontal movements are the ones that we teach first and get people to, to actually be able to do that consistently. And I tell people whenever they are doing something that's technique sensitive, uh, get to the point where you can walk into your clinic and you can say, I can, I can do this test on any of you normal people and come up with normal results immediately. So you have so much confidence that when you have a normal cooperative patient, you can get a normal result uh, without any question. And then when you do get something that's not normal, you have uh, a high confidence level that it is abnormal and it's not just a user error. And so once you develop the ability to do these, then this is a quick and easy test. And it's very comprehensive because we're talking, talking about uh, all six canals rather than one canal, right? And that's what you would do when you did a caloric test, just a lateral canal. And all of these things is in a, uh, it, it's, it's in the attempt to be more sensitive to actually finding pathology rather than having the patient come back with no findings, though they still have legitimate uh, symptoms. But in the end, you end up with a graph like this. This is head movement here. And of course, we see the eye movement is equal and opposite to it. And when you have a result like that, that's normal. So there's nothing wrong with that semicircular canal. However, when there is an impairment, you end up with a corrective saccade like this. This would be called an overt saccade. And it actually, it actually took place after the head or the, the particular head impulse had just ended. And doctors have been doing this. Uh, in fact, I just installed a system at the Shepherd Spinal Center in Atlanta. And they had been doing a head impulse test all along when they've been doing it bedside. And they, try, they, they do the head impulses as they watch the patient's eyes. And they try to see this uh, overt saccade that takes place uh, after, the, after the head movement. Notice that the, the eye in this case didn't, didn't move equal and opposite. This is the head movement and this is the eye movement. And the eye didn't move equal and opposite, not quite equal. But then there's a corrective saccade that takes place at the end. This is the abnormal finding. 
and it indicates an impairment in that canal. But some, and this you could see if you were trained, you could actually see this if you just did it by yourself without recording anything bedside. The problem is that there are also covert saccades like this one. This occurred while the, uh, the head impulse was taking place and that you would never be able to see. It's too quick and you wouldn't be able to see it. And so um, that's why this type of equipment is necessary to record this. So you're just going to make about 10 to 15 of these him impulses in each one of these directions. You're going to do a right and left lateral and then you're going to do the LARP and the RARP, LAUP test and you've got them all. And in the end, a normal patient is going to look like this. These were the two lateral canals, okay, right and left. Uh, and you, you end up with a trace that is symmetrical like this and there are no corrective saccades, either covert or overt in there. And then the equipment gives you some other types of analysis. It's just a graph, in this case, it's a graph of gain. Um, and, and, and the right impulses are red and the left impulses are blue. And when this is a normal test, these are all clustered in the same area. And uh, they give you other graphs. And when the graphs are symmetrical, left versus right like this, uh, left versus right like that, uh, then you know without a doubt that there's absolutely nothing wrong with this patient. But watch what you get when you have a patient with a vestibular anomaly. It's obvious. These are the corrective saccades, very, very clearly there. And then everything is asymmetrical on the numbers. Uh, here you can see that there is a, a major problem on the left, nowhere near sufficient gain. The proper gain would be, or perfect gain would be 1.0 here. And you have an asymmetry here that's obvious. You've got an asymmetry here that's obvious. So. Uh, this is a quick and easy and very, very inclusive test to be able to do once you develop the, um, the, the proper technique. I'll get that in a second. In the end, you have all six canals and you have a, a graph uh, printout that looks like this. But we have more interest in this, even though there's no CPT code for it, because uh, it is quick and easy and comprehensive uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest in it. We, we actually installed more of these in, so far in, nine, in 2017 than we have in, uh, since the system was, was introduced. Uh, so in the last three years, we sold more in the, in the last nine months than, than we have sold in, in the two, two years before that. So it's, it's getting, uh, uh, and, and who buys it? Balance centers. Uh, hospital-based balance centers and, and practice-based, private practice-based balance centers. But these are centers that are trying to be, trying to be uh, very comprehensive in their testing and they add this to the vestibular testing that they've already been doing. So I wanted to talk a little bit also about VEMPS. That's on the list and we have, every year we have more and more clinics that want to add VEMP to the testing that they're doing. Um, and there are basically two types of VEMPs. There is a cervical VEMP and an ocular VEMP. The cervical VEMP is the more commonly uh, measured one. And uh, people have been interested in this, say, up for the last six or seven years. And every year we have more and more clinics that are adding this to the routine tests that they do uh, on, on balanced patients. And in fact, recently, some of the manufacturers have been able to add a EMG monitor to the equipment. Because one thing about the cervical VEMP is it is an inhibitory test, not an excitatory test, but an inhibitory test. So the response actually inhibits a muscle contraction. The patient actually has to contract their sternocleidomastoid muscle here. Uh, and hold that contraction during the time of the test because the response is an actual attenuation of that contraction. 
Uh, and that's why that's so important. And any type of pathology shows up as an asymmetry between left and right. <laughs> and uh, so if the patient does a better job contracting the left side and a poorer job on the right side, uh, then you can have a false positive that's just due to the patient's contraction of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And we tried all kinds of different ways to do it. Oh, have the patient turn their head like this. Okay, that's fine. But what if they do it the, on the other side and they do better when they're facing right than they do left? Um, and so, I, uh, Neil Shepard told me one time, take a blood pressure cuff and have it on the patient's hand and have him push his face against his hand and actually read the meter, and the meter would have to be at 30 or 40 or something like that in order for the patient to know he's applying enough pressure. So we've tried all of that, and uh, none of that has really worked. There were too many false positives until we came up with the idea of laying the patient down supine, having him lift his head so that he can actually see his feet from heel to toe, and then turn and look at his shoulder. Uh, so this gives you a very much of a maximal contraction of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. And all of our users who do that regularly are successful with it, except for patients that can't do that test, because you really have to hold it for about 15 seconds. Uh, so we have some people that just can't do that. And the alternative that we give them most of the time is to adjust the exam table to the 30 degree position that you would do calorics in and let the patient do the same thing with the back of the exam table raised up to 30 degrees, which is a little easier on the stomach muscle. And most of the patients can do that. And it gives you close to a maximal contraction, and we've been having good results with that. But now some of the equipment has a new feature, like this. This is a, this is a measurement of the EMG, all right? So the contraction of the sternocleidomastoid muscle is is actually recorded and you can make sure that the patient does the same amount of uh, gives the same amount of effort for right and left in fact we uh, I've used that and tried the different techniques that we've used over the years and yes it's very easy to get it wrong when um, you're just turning the patient's head like we used to do but when you have them lying supine raise their head up so they can see their feet and then turn and look at their shoulder then it's almost automatically equal i didn't know that it was equal i assumed it was equal before but now that we have the monitor i know that it's equal in fact there's an external monitor that you can put on these systems that actually turns green when the patient does it the correct amount and is red when they when they don't do it the correct amount so they can actually watch that while they're doing it and they'll know they'll know uh, that they're uh, they're contracting the muscle properly so that's that's an excellent thing in this system but why people want to do the c vamp and the old vamp is because it adds to the comprehensive testing of the vestibular system the v hit test was good for us because we got all six semicircular canals three on each side but what about the rest of the vestibular system well if you include uh, an OVAMP and a C-VAMP, you've got it, because where does this C-VAMP, the cervical uh, VAMP, come from? Well, it actually comes from the saccula, uh, and it's mediated by the inferior inf uh, the saccula, and it's, it's mediated by the inferior vestibular nerve, and the OVAMP originates in the utricle, and it's mediated by the superior vestibular nerve, and so once you've added a C-VAMP and an O-VAMP to the V-HIT testing, you're pretty comprehensive. Uh, if there's patho vestibular pathology, you'd be pretty comprehensive in being able to find it. And you haven't even done your VNG test yet. So what's some great things about VEMP? Another great thing about a VEMP test, it only takes 15 seconds. That's one good thing. Another good thing is it's not affected by centrinoal hearing loss because it really has nothing to do with the, the cochlea. It's not a cochlear response. 
right? It's not mediated by the cochlea afferent. So, what are we actually doing? Why are we doing this on a, a auditory evoked potential system? Well, we're using a um, we're, we're using an auditory stimulus um, actually to, in the case of a CVAMP, to punch the saccule. I'm actually using that to punch the saccule. So I want to use whatever signal I have, whatever auditory stimulus I have that's going to give me the best bang for the buck here, right? Because that's what I'm actually doing. Uh, as I said before, the CVAMP is inhibitory. That's why that patient has to contract that muscle. Everything else that we measure, ABR, ECOG, OVAMP, all these things, they are excitatory responses. This is the only thing we do that's actually inhibitory. And that's what makes it, uh, that's what makes it interesting. Another little problem that we have with this test is that there's plenty of type pathologies that can make it abnormal. It could be abnormal if there's a vestibular neurosis, an acoustic neuroma, labyrinthitis, a brainstem stroke. Conductive hearing loss will give you a false positive. Meniere's disease, disease and superior canal dehiscence, that's a big one, because this is a classic test for that. Uh, and so the reason I put this slide up and the monkey is uh, scratching his head is, be, is to emphasize that any test by itself um, as, uh, it just isolated by itself won't give you the comprehensive information that you're trying to have. It really needs to be part of a battery of tests. And once you have the complete battery of tests, then, then you've got everything and you can differentiate one type of pathology from another. So you, you wouldn't want your doctors to order uh, a CVAMP, for example, in isolation and no other testing involved because it certainly would need a much more inclusive workup. But here's a good slide to have, and this is why I wanted to give you a handout, uh, and you can get these from the ALA organization. You can get the actual uh, uh, PowerPoint if, if you wanted it. Uh, but this is a good slide to have because it kind of gives you the different pathologies that can make a VEMP test abnormal and how it is actually abnormal with that particular like uh, labyrinthitis here, and in most of the tests, the, the VEMP response will be either absent or significantly reduced on the side that's affected by the pathology. But there are some cases, like superior canal dehiscence, where the VEMP response is actually enhanced on that side. You've got a giant one, you go, wow. Uh, in fact, you find a threshold of it to determine that it is, in fact, an enhanced response on the, that side. But that's, that's unique to superior canal dehiscence. Most of the pathologies will cause the response to be absent or significantly reduced. So here's the electrode montage that was recommended in all of the literature. So it's very simple. You take the electrodes that you would normally have behind the ear when you did an ABR and move them to the spinal clear, the uh, SCM I'll call it now because it's easier to pronounce. You move it to the SCM muscle and what I tell users to do is to typically put it in the middle of the upper third, right smack in the middle of the upper third. You could divide this in thirds, lower third, middle third, upper third, right in the middle of the upper third, right smack on that muscle as they uh, turn their head and try to look at their shoulder. Uh, and the ground we were putting right here, and I always complained about that. I didn't want to put it there on guys' hair and everything. And on women, I didn't want to go there with that. Uh, and so I was wishing we could put it somewhere else. And then I, uh, I was at a conference, and uh, Dave Sapala was talking. He's a statistician. He's with the Mayo Clinic. And he, uh, he said, he felt the same way I did about putting that electrode here. Uh, and so he said, I'm going to do a research project. I'm going to just put it on the forehead and see if it makes any difference clinically. And it didn't. And I said, David, that's the best thing I ever heard because now from now on, I'll put it on the forehead. It'll be so much easier. So that's what we do. Uh, so just three electrodes like that. Uh, 
And then here's what we have the patient do. They're lying supine, uh, and then they raise their head so they can see their feet, and then they just turn away from the stimulus um, and look at their shoulder. Um, we actually tell them to look at their shoulder, and they have to hold that position for about the 15 seconds that it takes to do this test. Uh, if they can't actually do that, uh, then I just raise the back of the chair to the third degree position that we would normally do calorics in and let them do it that way. And if you have the vent monitor, then you can have them just watch that. Well, how do you do this? You use, we use a tone burst because we found it gives you the highest amplitude and the lowest frequency that we can get a lot of intensity. You, you want to do it at least at 100 dB. So on some equipment, you can get 100 dB or 105. Remember, we're just trying to punch the sacral. We really don't care to be frequency specific. Uh, so 500 hertz, if, if it'll go loud enough, on some equipment, it'll only go to 80 dB, and that's not enough. Uh, so then I use 750, as long as I can get at least 100 dB out of it. I like 105 if I can get that. Uh, but the response diminishes as you uh, turn down the intensity of the stimulus. And then when you get to 90 or 95 dB, that's it. You've arrived at the threshold. You go any lower and it's gone. And less, unless it's superior canal dehiscence, and then you'll find an abnormally low threshold, something around 65 or 70, and you'll, you'll, we'll have confirmed that it is uh, superior canal dehiscence. Okay? All right. So the protocols that we use is a tone burst, 500 or 750, whichever one will go louder. Uh, and I just make it a condensation click. Uh, I, I just do it at a low rate, 5 to 8 per second. Uh, no Bayesian weighting or anything like that. I'm trying to punch the saccule so we got a better result just by unit, using linear. No Bayesian, I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not talking about Bayesian weighting. No a Blackman filter, no Blackman filter. Uh, just linear filters uh, on the tone burst. And then uh, intensity, something over 100 dB. Uh, and you can have a rise time of two milliseconds, that's fine. That's the same thing we do for most tone burrs. The gain is much lower. This is going to be a bigger response than you're used to. So you can't have the gain of the system at uh, 100,000 or 150,000 like you normally would. You have to turn it way down to like 100,000. No artifact rejections, just turn that off. No such thing. Filters are about 10 hertz to 1,000 hertz, or even 10 hertz to 500 hertz. This is a low frequency response. Uh, I collect it in a 100 millisecond window, uh, and I do about 120 tone bursts, 200 at the maximum, right? And do it twice to make sure it replicates. Uh, and then you notice that these are way off the scale, and you've got to, you've got to turn the scaling down until it until it's actually fits on the screen. But you can have that slide just so you have the protocol. And on most equipment, you can put that protocol in. And there's a positive and a negative peak. The first peak is going to occur somewhere between 12 and 19 milliseconds. And then the second peak is going to occur between 20 and 28 milliseconds. This is from the Mayo Clinic at David Zapala. Uh, and it'll have an amplitude. Uh, typically around 180 microvolts. Now, that's a big, big response, 180 microvolts. An ABR at high intensity on an adult, wave 5, is about a half a microvolt. Now, we're talking about 180 microvolts. I remember I was showing the students at Auburn this one time. I forget what year it was. Uh, and there were like eight or nine students in the class. and. Uh, they, they were all young ladies, and one young lady, her neck was outstanding, and when she turned her head, you, that sternocleidomastoid muscle just popped right out. And I said, um, what do you do? And she said, I'm in the ROTC, sir. And every morning we get up and we, we do five miles of running, we do a thousand push-ups, and, uh, and then we're ready for the clinic. And I go, oh boy, you're, gonna, you're going to be the test patient in this. Uh, and her, her uh, C-VEMP was off the scale. It was like 400, not 180, very typical for an adult, but like 400. And you would, you would think, if you looked at it at first, that you had 
uh, Superior Canal to Hissons on that side, but the other side was the same. Uh, you would always have a, uh, uh, an asymmetry in abnormal cases. It was just that she had such a prominent uh, sternocleidomastoid mastoid muscle. Anyway, that was, that was interesting. So it's going to look like this. This is on a biologic uh, ABR unit. Uh, there's the first peak. And, then, and depending on how you have the electrodes, this could be reversed. So if you see it in the literature that looks like this is upside down, that's fine. doesn't matter what you do. Well, as long as you, you mark this peak and you mark that peak, and you're going to find the amplitude of it and compare the amplitude of the right to the amplitude of the left, you see these were run twice, and I got the same thing twice, so I'm pretty confident I've got a, a nice muscle contraction. Uh, and you'd have to have a difference in amplitude ratio of more than 0.35 in order for this to be significant, right? So what's important about the CVAMP? Well, stimulus level, that you got it loud enough, and I say at least 100 dB, Stimulus frequency that you don't go over 750. It's either done at 500 or 750. Uh, make sure they're contracting that muscle enough and equally for right and left. And the technique that we explained is the best one for that. And make sure that you don't have a fa false positive because you didn't put the uh, electrodes equally, right? So they have to be symmetrical. You can't have one up here and one down here. If you did that, then you'd have a false positive as well. But this is really all you have to do. Once you get used to looking at these four things, you'll avoid having a false positive. And if you've got the EMG monitor, uh, it even helps more. So um, I, have, I have our users be sure that the response is present and that it is repeatable, uh, that they can do it twice and get basically the same thing. And uh, look at it and see if the amplitudes are equal, because if, if they're within 50% of each other, they're fine. Uh, however, if they're not, or if it, boy, it looks like there's a 50% difference or more, then we have them calculate the asymmetry ratio. And a, an asymmetry ratio of greater than 0.35 is considered abnormal. And when you say that, asymmetry ratio, audiologists go, what? How do you do that? Uh, well, it's, it's pretty easy. It's simply this. It's the, it's the difference over the sum. And if you multiply it by, by 100, you can have it turn it into a percentage. But it's just the difference over the sum. So you take the two amplitudes, you know, subtract the smaller from the larger one, get the difference, add them to, together, and you've got the sum and just do the division and you've got a number and if it is uh, uh, if it's greater than 0.35 then it's abnormal okay and usually the response on the affected side is absent uh, or reduced okay and when is a CVAMP contraindicated well if there's a conductive loss why that makes sense because we're using auditory stimulus to s punch the saccule, right? Well, if there's a conductive loss, then there's something that's muffling the punch. And so that's going to that's gonna make it uh, contraindicated. If the patient can't do the task, they don't have enough stomach muscle to be able to lift and turn like that, that could do it. Um, and uh, I have some patients where you can't find their SCM on their neck, right? Are you turning your head? Look at your shoulder. That's the best instruction. And you can't even see this. You're taking a guess where it is. Well, uh, very high possibility of a false, uh, a false positive on that, right? So that might be one. And then I put this last one in there. Uh, you did an ABR on the same day. A lot of clinics, they, this is another test that there's no CPT code for. Uh, so um, a lot of clinics do an ABR. They do a quick ABR at 90 in order to be able to uh, charge that ABR CPT code. Uh, but of course, if they did an ABR on the same day um, for some other reason, uh, they, they might not be wanting to do a CVAMP also and try to charge for that twice. OK, well, what about an OVAMP? 
All right, well, that's pretty easy to do. That's an excitatory response. It's not an inhibitory. So the patient doesn't have to do anything except look up. Uh, and now we are getting a response not from the saccule, but the utricle, and not from the inferior vestibular nerve, but the superior vestibular nerve. And we're recording it on one of the ocular muscles below the eye. I'll show you how you put the electrodes on in a minute. You're going to identify in the same the same type of pathologies as you did with the CVAMP, so that's good. Um, and you're going to use the same exact protocol, except that the gain is going to go back up to 100,000, the same gain that you would use for an ABR or an ECOG. Otherwise, it's the same thing. Um, and you're going to get a response that's a little bit different. You got two peaks. The first one, um, we call it N1. That's going to occur somewhere around 10 milliseconds. P1, the positive peak, is going to occur somewhere around 14 milliseconds. And it's recorded from the contralateral eye, not the ipsilateral. Uh, so it's a little bit different than we're used to. And the same thing, the amplitude ratio is what matters. And it would have to be greater than 0.35 or 35% to be significant. How do you place the electrodes just like this? Right? You can do it with a two-channel system or a one-channel system. Uh, with a two-channel system, you don't have to uh, change electrodes or plug in different electrodes when you uh, change ears. Uh, but those muscles, those are the muscles you're actually collecting this from. I get this one as close as I can to the eye, and this one as close as I can to this electrode without touching it. And then during the test, the patient is looking up. We actually give them a target on the ceiling, to, and they have to keep their eyes on during the test. I heard that when pediatric clinics do it, they actually hold uh, a iPad up for them to look at. And they've got a cartoon running on the iPad. So as long as they hold their eyes there, you get a response something like this. is on a Biologic Navigator Pro. Uh, and the contralateral side is the one that you want to measure the amplitude on, peak-to-peak -peak amplitude, and compare it with the uh, stimulus in the other ear. All right, so that was just an overview of um, two things. We had an overview of the video head impulse test, and uh, then we just did the CVAMP and the OVAMP, uh, and those, those things have been in the last couple of years extremely popular and you can see why because you're really comprehensive in your testing of the vestibular system if you add these to what you're already doing. I, we still have a lot of doctors who order ECOGs all the time, right? Your, your doctor in, in Huntsville is ordering ECOGs every single day, right? Dr. Dang orders Dang ECOGs all the time. Uh, so they eat, sleep, ECOGs over there. Now, do you do any ABRs? They'll say, oh, very seldom. But ECOGs we do every single day. And luckily, ECOGs are easier to do than they've ever been before with the, with the, uh, with the new equipment. Uh, the trick is to get the, to get the electrode. And now we're not going to use electrodes on the ear lobe or on the mastoid, we're going to use an electrode that's actually in the ear canal. And we're going to get that electrode as close as we can to the eardrum because we're trying to pick up a signal that is generated within the cochlea. And um, uh, we want to be as close to the source as possible. Right? In fact, that's very important. And we try to tell the students who are first time uh, people trying to learn how to do this to be very, very careful to get it as deep an insertion in the canal and use, use the ones that even look like they're, like, like they're pediatric, even in an adult canal, just so you can get it deeper. Because the deeper you, you are able to insert the electrode in the ear canal, the higher the amplitude of the response is going to be. So if we're using ear canal versus a TM electrode or an electrode on the promontory, a needle electrode through the eardrum. Uh, most people do it ear canal, but it's very important that they're, they're 
in this range where they're able to really get it very, very deep. It takes a little bit of practice, but you can do it with tip trodes, a little gold electrode like this with special leads, um, an ear canal electrode. And these are responses on a vibosonic integrity. All right, that's on my left ear. And I, I don't have, uh, I didn't put my audiogram on here, but I, I've got a high frequency hearing loss. Not enough for a hearing aid yet, but uh, <laughs> will be someday. But have you ever seen a better ECOG? Right? Marilyn Gresham walked up to the booth and she goes, boy, that's a good, you know, that's a great ECOG, the first thing she said. Um, and um, I mean, this should be in a textbook. But this was very, very easy to do within just a couple of hundred uh, clicks uh, and couldn't miss the summing potential, couldn't miss the action potential. And did it twice and very repeatable uh, and very typical. Even on a patient, oh, there's, I did put my audiogram, there's my audiogram. So not too bad. So what do we use? We use clicks uh, at a relatively slow rate, something like this, uh, alternating polarity to cancel out the cochlear microphonic so I can actually see a true summing potential not corrupted by a cochlear microphonic. We do it at, you know, as high an intensity possible. I do it at least 95 dB. Uh, of course, it's an insert electrode with an insert transducer and masking isn't necessary. Uh, we have some clinics that are using this. This is a, a little electrode that actually sits on the tympanic membrane but I only have two. I only have two clinics actually doing that. Everybody else is doing it with tip trodes. And it used to be very hard to collect an ECOG with tip trodes, but with the newer equipment, we're not having that much of a problem, except with patients with excessive hearing loss. And of course, what do you get? Well, uh, an action potential and a summing potential. And it's the amplitude difference between the amplitude of the summing potential, this amplitude here, from baseline to the peak, versus the amplitude of the action potential. This is the eighth nerve action potential from the baseline to the peak. Uh, and in normal patients, this summing potential will be very low. If it exceeds half of the action potential, that's when it's abnormal and it's an indicator of Meniere's disease. That's why the doctor ordered the test to begin with. So here we're just looking, a, a lot of times when you look in the literature, you see it upside down. You go, boy, that's upside down. Uh, well, that's the way it was done originally. We just decided that we like all the waves going up, so we've reversed the electrodes. But it's the same thing as summing potential and an action potential, and a summing potential amplitude being less than half of the action potential amplitude, which it is in these two cases. Here's others with the waves going up that we're more used to. No doubt that this is a repeatable summing potential and action potential there. It's repeated down here. Same thing here. I wouldn't have to even do any calculation on this, and the machine will do it automatically. The software will do it. But I wouldn't even have to calculate the ratio just by looking at it. That's a very small fraction of the action potential amplitude. But you've got to watch the hearing loss. Here's the big problem. Doctors are trying to order this test, and you know you're never going to get it when you have a significant high-frequency loss like this. I didn't have a significant loss. That's why I still got it on mine. Uh, but on this patient, what do you expect to get? I'll show you what we got. Got this. I, his left ear was normal, of course, and we've got a perfect ECOG, but we couldn't get it at all on, on his right ear. And, and we should have known that when we looked at the, at the audiogram. So a lot of clinics, when they're talking to their doctors, they come up with a, a rule. Like what's very common is, a, is a, a 2K20 or 2K25 rule. In other words, you look at the threshold at 2K, and if it exceeds 25 dB, then we're not going to do an ECOG with tip trodes because we know we won't get a good result. But a lot of times, well, you try it anyway, even though 50 dB threshold at 2,000, um, yeah. you just you just never get it. So as a clinic, if you could just have a rule of what patients are, are candidates for uh, ECOGs with tip trodes and which are not, that would be helpful. Here's an abnormal case. Notice in the left ear, there's a clear summing potential here, and this summing potential is uh, 
clearly less than half of the amplitude of the action potential. But look at this on the affected side of Meniere's. Uh, baseline to summing potential way up here, uh, and baseline to action potential. And you end up with an SPAP ratio of greater than 0.5. That's what makes it abnormal. So here's, here's the rules of thumb. This, this is good to know if you're doing ECOGS for the first time. The first thing to look for is where's the action potential, and you should find it quickly and easily at about 1.5 milliseconds at 95 dB on a normal adult. Uh, and so that's the first thing. If you don't have that, forget it. You've got too much hearing loss. And where's the summing potential going to be? Find this first and mark it, and then move your cursor back about 0.6 milliseconds, and the summing potential is going to be there. Find the action potential first, move the cursor back about 0.6, maybe 0.7 milliseconds at the most, and you'll find the summing potential. Uh, how to find the baseline? Well, you found the summing potential, move it back about 0 0.4, 0 0.5 milliseconds to the left of that, and there's the baseline. Right? A lot of times I say this. Um, if I'm trying to mark this, here's the base. This is a mountain, and so the action potential is a mountain peak. And if I fell off this mountain and I got down here, I see there's a little foothill. Well, the top of the foothill is the summing potential, and then the, the bottom of that foothill, that valley, that's the baseline. So a lot of times we use that. But it's good to know how many milliseconds separates them, right? An SPAP ratio of um, anything greater than 0.5 is abnormal. And unfortunately, the predictive positive value is just 63%. In other words, in 63% of patients with Meniere's disease, you'll actually get an abnormal uh, ECOG on. So it's, it's, it's not as sensitive as we'd like it to be. Um, a couple of other things to know is uh, you got to use prep in the ear canal. Now, you're not just doing skin prep, you're actually doing ear canal prep. And we just use a, uh, a Q-tip, but we put a little bit, a little dab of new prep on the Q-tip, so we're degreasing and abrading the ear canal, and we're doing it very deep, very deep canal placement. That's necessary. Make sure you insist on at least a 2K25 rule. Now, no threshold at 2K worse than 25. Uh, if I'm expect to be able to do this test. And of course, like everything, you remember, if it doesn't replicate, you must investigate. I see people that don't have replicable ECOG responses, and they just keep on doing one after another and another and another until they got a bump that comes up around uh, 1.5 milliseconds, and they call that the action potential. And, and they, mark, they mark it down at the bottom somewhere as a summing potential, and it's nothing because it doesn't repeat. It just happens to be a random EEG that, that showed up like that. Um, if you do it enough, you'll find one, even when it's not there. Um, there is a new test, and uh, some of the manufacturers like Interacoustics and Biologic already have it on their equipment, and the other manufacturers are actually putting it on their equipment, even as we speak, and that's a measurement of the area. It's the ECOG. Not, not only the SPAP ratio, but the area ratio. That's the area under the curve, right? Uh, and why would we want to do this? Well, the sensitivity is higher. The sensitivity isn't 63%. Now it's 83%. And it's very, very easy to do. When it's on your equipment, you definitely want to do it because it's a, it makes this test way more sensitive. And all you got to do is uh, this is... Uh, with the summing potential, you want to mark the baseline and the summing potential, the action potential, and then so not just the leading trough, but the, the, uh, uh, the end of it too. So you really have to do four marks like this. I know it's upside down, but just four marks like this. And then it's able to give you the area, and it just makes it more sensitive when you're able to measure the area um, rather than just the APSP ratio. Right. And so 
I put this slide up here. The ROI is return on investment, right? Uh, interacoustics and their interacoustics eclipse. Eclipse is their model num their model of their auditory evoked potential system, but they have a model that you could buy. Uh, this particular version of this equipment would be if you were testing really all adults and you're doing adult ABRs, ECOGs and VEMPs, C-VEMPs and OVEMPs, and you just wanted it configured like that, all right? Well, they'll sell that for 14000 and you've got to buy a notebook computer. I put it at 2500 because you'd never spend more than 2500 on a notebook computer. So it totally would cost you sixteen five. It'd probably be pretty close to fifteen five. Um, but anyway... So what do you get for doing an ABR, an adult diagnostic ABR, about 137, uh, ECOG about 75. So if you were doing those two tests, and yeah, you did VEMPs, you did VEMPs too, um, but this is what your reimbursement's going to be, uh, something around uh, 212. Well, if you paid that much for the laptop computer, it would take you 78 patients for this thing to pay for itself. Well, if you work that out, if you did three patients a day, it would be five weeks. If you did one patient a day, it would be 15 weeks. So in a lot of clinics, um, this could pay for itself, and you would end up doing ECOGs, or CVEMPs, and OVEMPs with it, and you'd add a lot to your uh, sensitivity of your uh, balance clinic. Uh, well, an, uh, an ECOG doesn't really have to take that long. Uh, I told you that a, a CVAMP doesn't take long, or an OVAMP, because you're only doing, uh, you're only doing this for about 10, 10 15 seconds per, per run, and you do four runs, two on each side. So that's a very, very quick test. Uh, and these two, I never do over 1,000 stimuli at about 10 per second, so there's no reason why you couldn't do both ears in, in 20 minutes on this if you're getting a response. Now, if you can't get a response, well, that's because you had too much hearing loss and, and you, know, you just wouldn't waste time on it. Uh, all right, well, so it's, it's just saying that this equipment can pay for itself if it's used enough. Uh, and, uh, and in a lot of clinics, it is. All right, well, in the, in the two minutes that I have left before lunchtime, uh, I, I was involved in a project with Micromedical, that's our main uh, manufacturer of uh, uh, vestibular equipment, VNG systems. And uh, they were writing new software, and uh, they, they wanted a consultant on that. Uh, and I said, well, I'll, I'll, I'll be one of your consultants, provided you have your meetings in good places. I don't want to go to Chicago or Minneapolis in the winter. Uh, and so they said, well, we can have meetings in um, Key West, I said, that's good. Um, oh, we had another one in Barcelona, that was good. Um, anyway, we were trying to come up with the, the, the best possible VNG system in the world. What would you do? Well, they were using guys like me that had just been around long enough where we saw everything that was ever there. We know the good, bad, and ugly about them. And tried to come up with um, what is the best possible, most efficient VNG system. So I'm just going to give you some of the highlights. Um, this is uh, Micromedical's new software, and it has a touch screen, and it was designed for a touch screen, so it's very easy to work the software with never touching the mouse at all on a touch screen. It makes it where it's very intuitive, very, very quick, right? Um, and, of course, we wanted, we wanted to be able to... Um, to customize the protocol. So any protocol that you want, you can do it. It has the ultimate capability to make custom protocols. You want to put a head shake test in. Anything that you want to do, you can put in there very, very easily. If you had no instruction at all, it's so intuitive uh, in ways to actually make custom protocols. You might have several clinicians, and they each want to do it differently. You can make a different protocol for each one. Uh, another nice thing about it is we put in audio cues, uh, and so we can actually set this up so that drawing a test, it will, it will, it'll cue you when the, when the test starts by actually saying, start test. And then 
if we're running the test for, say, 30 seconds, it'll say 30 seconds. And then when it gets to 15 seconds, it'll go 15 seconds. Then when it gets to 10, 10 seconds, 5 seconds, uh, and then it beeps when it's done. We can have it just beep at different intervals or actually say how many seconds are left. We wanted that in there because we thought it was, uh, it was a helpful thing. We also put a, an extra camera, a situational camera in, so that you can actually record what the patient's doing. Uh, you have a video of the patient, and you're going to hear the audio of what they're saying and what the clinician is saying. And that's kept where it's very easy to get to the patient videos. So any, every part of the test, uh, whether it was a caloric or a hall pike or you were, do, you were doing saccades or whatever, you can actually see what the patient was doing and hear what they were saying and hear what the clinician was saying. Very easy to get to, very easy to, uh, uh, to share with someone else. Another thing is auto fixation. You know, sometimes, sometimes the only time you're able to test fixation suppression, right, visual fixation suppression, is drawing the calorics. Uh, when all of a sudden you're able to say to the patient, okay, I'm going to put a red light on inside of the goggles, I want you to look at that. Uh, and then watch their nystagmus decrease. But the problem is that what's the best time to do it? You don't want to do it when the nystagmus is at its peak because you have to measure the slow phase velocity at the peak of the nystagmus response. So we have it where it's automatically now, it automatically determines when is the peak and about 10 seconds after the peak, it puts the fixation light on in the goggles and leaves it on for 10 seconds and then it perfectly calibrates the, uh, the visual fixation suppression ratio for you. Uh, so it, it, it makes that test totally automatic and very, very effective because the the strongest indicator you have of central pathology is the failure of fixation suppression. And a lot of times, the only time you can test it is during the caloric, and you either forget to do it, or, or by the time you do it, the nystagmus is gone, because uh, you don't want to do it too early. This, this determines when is the optimal time and does it automatically. Uh, we thought that was a good feature. And of course, the feature of a very large external TV. We have uh, them that are even 60 inches in, in, uh, in diagonal measures. Uh, and, and so they're gigantic. The patient is only 36 inches in front of it. It fills up their whole visual field, and you get perfect optokinetic responses from it. And when you're not doing ocular motor testing, then you've got the two giant eyeballs right in front of you that you couldn't miss from the other side of the room. And you can see anything, rotary response or anything like that. So that's, that's a great thing. Micromedical has always had that, and we made it even bigger on the uh, new software. Um, and then um, when you're done, everything, there, there's, a, there's a great list of everything that you've done. The ones that are abnormal have a big red diamond on them that they're abnormal. And you can decide what you want to print on the printout. You, know? you might want to print only the abnormal responses. Don't bother printing the ones that are normal. Just do the abnormal ones, where you can filter them like that um, and decide immediately what prints and what doesn't print. Um, we thought about how do you start the system? When you're doing a, a hall pike, for example, both of your hands are on the patient. And it, okay, now turn your head all the way to the right. I'm going to take you down. Don't worry. Here we go. You ready? One, two, three. Down we go. Right? So how do you start the recording? Uh, well, yeah, there's a remote, so you can start it by a remote, but you have that hanging on a lanyard on your, around your neck, and you can't get at it. Both of your hands are on the patient. Oh, you could have a foot pedal, um, and this system comes with the remote and the foot pedal for people who like foot pedals. I always lost the foot pedal. Where is it? I need it now, and it's underneath the, uh, uh, underneath the uh, a table or something. Um, but they were brilliant. They put a button on the goggles that you could easily put your finger on. So when you've got your hands occupied on the patient and you want to start re the recording of the system, you just hit this button that's on the goggles there. Uh, and once you just take a little bit of practice, that's, e that's, that's what I use because that's great. Uh, so three different ways to start the system. We made sure that was in there. Uh, 
And then when we're playing back the video, if we recorded a video during the session, we want the playback to be excellent, where we can, we can just go frame by frame and watch it very slowly or very quickly. And we want to know, for everything that we see the eyes do, where is it? So we have a cursor that follows it. Whatever you see here, you know exactly what it is in the trace down here. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that was there. Uh, and lastly, uh, uh, all those videos that you might take from the patient, they're kept, they're kept so you can easily see the video that I did drawing the nystagmus test, the, the video that I did drawing the spontaneous test, the video I did drawing the hall pike test. Easy to find, not where, where is it? I did videos, but now I can never find them. Um, and we have this all working in what they call auto access, which is interacoustics, and, and, and it's integrated for Grace and Stadler as well. So any of their products, whether it's an audiometer, tympanometer, AB, um, evoke potential, or VNG, or VHIT, all of their systems working under the same uh, database, and that database is very easily integrated with electronic medical records because we know that everybody wants that. Well, that's all I had. If there is any questions, if not, we're done. Thanks, guys.